This is going to be Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to talk about the subject, don't get all tangled up in that. The first thing you don't want to get tangled up in is keeping the law to earn your way to heaven. In Galatians 5, 1, Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. When you got saved, you got liberty. And even though the Spirit doesn't lead you contrary to the law, you aren't in bondage to the law. Someone who adds works to the gospel puts the yoke of bondage back on you. People get all tangled up in that. They have no real assurance of salvation. And they may be living right today, but under their work system, they could backslide and lose salvation according to them. And that keeps them in consistent bondage throughout their life. They aren't relying on Jesus Christ to keep them saved. They're relying on themselves. Paul said in verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. It isn't that circumcision is wrong. That's not what Paul's saying. It is that it doesn't save anybody. The problem was that these preachers and works teachers were coming in and requiring it for salvation. If you look at Acts 15 and verse 1, it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. This is similar to, to how they do water baptism today, Paul is simply saying circumcision doesn't save. It's about Jesus Christ. If someone never comes to Jesus Christ by faith and just relies on their works their whole life, then they didn't get saved. Circumcision has nothing to do with it. If there was a day, if there was never a day when you came to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believed on him to take away your sins, then you are still in your sin. Even if you've been circumcised, even if you've been water baptized. Verse 3 For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Paul is saying to all those that are relying on circumcision to be a part of their salvation that they would also be in debt to do the whole law, the entire thing. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. So if you're relying on keeping the law to get yourself to heaven, and you mess up one time, you're guilty of all. Galatians 3.10 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So if you're going to tell me you're earning your way to heaven by living right, and you don't continue in all things that are written in the book of the law, you're kidding yourself. Nobody's done that anyway. Paul says in verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. This popular verse is used by the same people that Paul is talking against. And it's very ironic. The verse isn't saying someone falls from grace and loses their salvation. He's referring to those who rely on the law to save them. They are the ones that's fallen from grace. And those are the same people that use this verse to teach you can lose your salvation. And the, but the person this verse is referring to is either lost because they never believed on Christ and have always trusted in their works, or they can be saved and deceived and fallen from the truth of the grace of God. They are still saved if there was a point when they believed, but they are way out in left field now. They have took the law and they're thinking that they're keeping themselves saved by keeping the law. But the law never justifies anybody. In Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Galatians 5.5 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. What we are waiting for is a righteous body. We have our righteous inner man. 
but we are waiting on that righteous outer man. In Romans 8, 23 through 25, it says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, a hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. When Jesus Christ comes in the rapture, you will have the redemption of your body. And that's our hope. Verse 6 in Galatians 5, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. In Jesus Christ it isn't about circumcision, or any good works, or keeping any of the law. It's all about faith. And the faith which worketh by love. We don't do good works to get saved or to stay saved, but rather because we love Jesus Christ. It's faith which worketh by love. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the popular verse says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We don't do good works to get saved or stay saved or to prove we're saved. We do good works because faith worketh by love. Verse 7, You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? The Galatians were running well. Someone stepped in and tossed them to and fro and carried them about by every wind of doctrine. If the gospel is about faith and a works teacher causes you to add works to the gospel, then you are disobeying the gospel. Someone stepped in and carried them about with every wind of doctrine. They were truly saved because there was a time when they did obey the truth of the gospel. However, now they have been deceived and they're starting to think that things like circumcision plays a part in them maintaining their salvation. Galatians 5.8 Paul says, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Jesus Christ called you. He offers salvation by grace through faith. Those who are trying to persuade otherwise doesn't come from Jesus Christ. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. The context is false doctrine. If you get a lot of bad doctrine like this, it, it can affect big time. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And leaven is associated with bad doctrine in Matthew sixteen twelve, where it says, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. He says in Galatians 5.10, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. So Paul was confident that they are going to have a good reality check and get back to obeying the truth of the gospel. However, these guys who are spreading this false doctrine to deceive Christians have their judgment coming to them, whosoever they be. It don't matter who he is, he has it coming. Paul says in verse 11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross seized. So the preaching of the cross. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Men will quit preaching salvation by grace through faith and the blood to keep from looking foolish. They will give up preaching the cross because they think it makes them look foolish. If Paul quit preaching the cross and salvation by grace through faith, then his persecution would stop. You know why? Because people don't like the simple gospel. Because the simple gospel is all about the work of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with the work that you did. Man doesn't like to be told that he isn't good enough to play a part in getting to heaven because of his sin. So therefore, the average person is looking to their works in one form or another to get them to heaven. So Paul said, Now, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross seized. If Paul wanted the persecution to stop, he would preach circumcision requirement. 
If you believe in salvation by grace through faith without works, then you are the minority. Sometimes we are stuck in our own little Bible-believing bubble that we forget that we are very few in what we believe concerning salvation. Most people are trying to earn their way. Galatians 5.12, I would, they were even cut off, which trouble you. Paul is so upset with those works, teachers, that he wants rid of them. He said in Titus 1, 10 through 11, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And there's why they do it many times. For filthy lucre's sake, that's dirty money. Galatians 1, 8 and 9 says, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Paul's fed up with the works teachers. He says in Galatians 5.13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So see, we have liberty. In Christ, we don't have to get all tangled up in trying to keep ourselves saved. However, at the same time, we don't use this liberty for an occasion to the flesh. We don't use it to say, well, I'm saved, so I'm going to go and do whatever I want to do. We're not going to use our liberty as an occasion to the flesh. That's wrong. But by love, we serve one another. We do right out of love. Faith, which worketh by love, remember? Paul said, but by love, serve one another. It isn't about doing good to get saved. It isn't about doing good to stay saved. It isn't about doing good to prove to your pastor that you're saved. We do good because we love God and love one another. And as he said before, faith which worketh by love. Galatians 5.14, For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you have love, and what you do is based on love, then you're going to end up doing what the law says anyway. Because it says in Romans 13, 8 through 9, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Because if you're operating by love, then you're not going to kill your neighbor. If faith that's in you worketh by love, you're not going to steal his stuff. You're not going to take his wife. If you've got love in your heart there like you should for God and for others. Now, I didn't say if you were saved. I said, if you're loving like you should, you're not going to do these things to people. You can be saved and get cold and bitter and hard towards people. And then you're going to get in a place where you are, are living wrong. But if, if your heart's soft and you love people and you love God like you should, most likely you're not going to struggle with these things too much. You're not going to struggle with lying to somebody, stealing from somebody, mistreating people, because you are going to treat that person like you want to be treated. Galatians 5.15, But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. I've seen Christians go at each other with words until they are both devoured. Both of their testimonies are gone by the time they get done. It's cannibalistic because we are all members of the same body. And yet you're eating on each other. You're eating your own body. So don't get tangled up in all that works for salvation stuff. And next, don't get tangled up in the flesh. Galatians 5.16, this to say then, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Every time you get up in the morning, you need to reckon yourself dead. Remember that your spirit is alive and God has declared your flesh to be dead, why should you serve a zombie? Don't give the flesh everything at once. Get up with spiritual things on your mind. 
get up early and start moving. The more things you do the flesh doesn't like, the better. Galatians 5.17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. So the flesh is here, the spirit is here, they bump heads. They're contrary. They don't like each other. They're always fighting each other just just like two brothers that can't get along. Romans seven twenty two through 24, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Paul said he delights in the law after the inward man, the new man in him, loves it. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul had, had that inner man that loved the law of God. Then he had that outer man, the wretched man. And those two men are fighting. This is a war. It is a flesh versus the spirit. God allows you to be in control of which one you put in control. He doesn't automatically put the new man in the driver's seat. You can let the dead man drive. And if you let the dead man drive, then what do you think will happen? You are you are like that weekend at Bernie's movie sometimes. You're letting the dead flesh go out and party. You're letting your dead flesh just run things. Galatians 5.18, but if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. It is a saved man who can walk in the Spirit. It is a saved man who can be consistently relying on being led of the Spirit. And if you're saved, then you're not under the law. You're not in bondage to it, but at the same time, you don't use your liberty as an occasion to, to the flesh, but by love, faith which worketh by love, and by love you serve one another. Paul is about to name a whole bunch of uh, sins, sexual sins, things like that, that a saved person's flesh is still going to lust after if he doesn't consistently walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Now let's look at these words. And uh, the, you see, these sins right here are sins. A Christian who still has sinful flesh, so his flesh can still want these sins and commit these sins. A Christian can commit adultery. And adultery can be in thought and action. In Matthew 5.28, it says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. That shows it can be in thought. If you lie down with another woman who isn't your wife, then that's adultery. If you look on a woman with thoughts of that action in your mind, then that's adultery in the heart. Now, fornication, it's a little bit different. This is the, this is the action of any sexual sin. Any sex outside of the husband and wife relationship is fornication. Even if one of the two people involved are married, it's still fornication. For example, if a man steps out on his wife, he commits adultery, but at the same time, that adultery is fornication because it's any sexual sin with somebody that you're not married to. It's a sexual act between two people that aren't married. And that is even if they are both married to other people. Fornication isn't always adultery, but adultery is always fornication. And I know that's different from how a lot of people teach it. But I believe the Bible teaches, teaches that. Because notice in Revelation 2 how it uses fornication and adultery. It says in Revelation 2, 21 and 22, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So you see how it's used there. Then see how it's used in Matthew five thirty two, referring to saved people. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. When when a woman steps out on you and commits fornication, she's an adulteress, she's a fornicator, and it 
you're allowed to divorce her because she already joined flesh with somebody else and you're loose from her, you're able to marry somebody else for that reason. But you see how it's not just lost people that commit fornication, or it's not just single people that commit fornication. It can be married people too. It's adultery and fornication. Now the next thing, uncleanness. You know, anything just wicked, vile, filthy sin. Lasciviousness. When you can't control your urge, urges, you you give yourself over to stuff. The sin ends up controlling you. You make the flesh stronger by letting it out of the cage. And some people just can't keep the flesh in the grave. They can't reckon it dead for some reason. So lasciviousness, when you just can't control your sexual urges and things like that. Galatians 5.20 says idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions heresies now idolatry this doesn't have to be statues this could be your family your job your car video games or anything that you put ahead of the lord and worship that's your idol and colossians 3 5 says mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication uncleanness inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. If you're wanting something enough to covet it, then it's obviously an idol. Now the next thing, witchcraft. This can be like hocus pocus, or it can be a 13-year-old that won't listen to her parents. In Second Chronicles 33, 6, it's associated with the occult stuff like child sacrifice and devil communication in Second Chronicles 33, 6. But it can also be rebellion, as in First Samuel 15, 23, where it says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So you don't have to just be like the Sanderson sisters to be doing witchcraft. You can just be a rebellious teenager and be acting like a witch. Now, hatred, when you're just you know, you you find somebody, you're at disagreement with that person so much that you just don't even care if they died or if their life was ruined or you just dislike that person so much that, that you wish something bad would happen to them or that you could just kill them. You, you hate that person. Notice how hatred is associated with murder in 1 John 3, 14 and 15. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So, hatred. Just disliking somebody so much that you just can't stand them. And this is a the bad kind of hatred. I mean, there's a good kind of hatred in the Bible and there's a bad kind of hatred. Now, variance. When you're in disagreement so much and quick to disagree about everything, sometimes it seems like people would disagree no matter what you said. Emulations. Uh, when you try to do what someone else did, but for the sake of doing it better and outdoing them. It's not wrong to uh, follow somebody's pattern and do it how they did it, but don't let your motive of doing it be to outdo that person or to do it better. Now, wrath. Being angry and hateful towards someone to the point you want to take action. It's like rage expressed vehemently. Now, strife. That's fighting and quarreling. What you see people do when they are at variance. They go back and forth with words biting and devouring one another. This can lead to wrath, a rage expressed vehemently. This can be, this can lead to hatred to where you just despise that person. And many times it is because of emulations where you're trying to outdo somebody else to the point you're fighting with that person. 
People are worried about outdoing each other. The next thing, seditions, rising in opposition to law. In this case, when the law doesn't conflict with God's laws. You know, you need, when the law doesn't conflict with God's laws, you go by them. Heresies. This would be an opinion or doctrine that is false according to the Bible. Uh, Galatians 5.21, it goes on, says, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, envying, when you see someone who is better off than you in an area of life and you're mad about it, instead of rejoicing with them over it, you are overcome with a horrible feeling towards them because you wish you had what they had to the point you have negative thoughts toward them over it. You're envying them. Murders. Obviously, thou shalt not kill. And obviously, you don't want to have murder in your heart by hating somebody. Drunkenness. Even a little is too much. Someone may point out that Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 3, excess of wine. However, the excess is in the wine itself. Just the wine itself is too much. For example, he says excess of riot in the very next verse. Any rioting is bad. The excess is in the riot itself. The excess is in the alcohol itself. Revelings. Partying and wild dancing. Things like that. Paul is saying that the Christian who walks in these sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. It didn't say they wouldn't go to heaven. It said they wouldn't inherit the kingdom of God. Inheritance has to do with rewards. Colossians 3.24 Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. Inheritance is about serving and rewards, not about salvation. If you just live for the flesh all your life, you get your reward down here and you spend all your inheritance like the prodigal son. You need to quit walking in the flesh and you need to get the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, love. Once again, this is the reason we work for the Lord. Faith, which worketh by love. By love, serve one another. If you love the Lord and love your neighbor, then you don't have to worry about keeping the law. All of that just falls into place. Now, joy, love for God and others means you care about them more than yourself. You're willing to suffer for others like the Lord. This brings joy. Joy comes from putting the focus on someone else. When all the focus is on you, then you'll, you'll not have this fruit of joy because you're just focusing on yourself and your own problems. Peace. You got peace with God once and for all at salvation. You also get the daily peace of God when you walk in the Spirit. Long-suffering. If you want to be like the Lord, then this is one of his greatest characteristics. He is long-suffering with man. He puts up with us for a long period of time. A fruit, if you got the fruit of the Spirit, then you're, you're long-suffering with people. You're putting up with people's nonsense, and they got a lot of it. They mistreat you. On a day-to-day -day basis, people will mistreat you. And you're long-suffering. You don't just jump their case about mistreating you every day. I mean, it takes time for you to get to a point where you're just fed up. You know, you're long-suffering. Gentleness. This is how you should be towards anybody. Gentle. And the Bible says in James 3.17, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So when someone talks to you or asks you a, a question, you're peaceable, you're gentle, and easy to be entreated. It's easy for somebody to ask you something because you're gentle with people. You don't make people feel stupid. You don't mock their question. That's not the fruit of the Spirit if you do those things. The next thing, goodness do you have goodness? Romans 12, 21 says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Faith. 
Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, Galatians 5, 23, meekness, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, meekness, Moses is a great example of meekness. The definition for it is mild of temper, soft, gentle, not easily provoked or irritated, yielding, given to forbearance under injuries. That's meekness. It says Moses was the meekest man. You know, you search the word meek, it talks about Moses. Temperance. If you're temperate, then you do things in moderation and not in excess. Galatians 5.24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If you're saved, then your flesh is crucified with Christ. And there is no need for you to live for the same affections affections and lusts as you did before because if your flesh is crucified then you'd be living for a dead corpse if you served it galatians 5 25 and 26 if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another envying one another this is a problem uh, many men who live for god in almost every aspect of life will seek vain glory they will provoke one another they will envy one another. All these are works of the flesh that Christians can commit daily, but they aren't talked about. You see, a Christian still has the sinful flesh. But if you've got faith which worketh by love, if you by love serve one another, you're not going to get tangled up in the flesh as much as somebody who lacks in love. Don't get tangled up in keeping the law to stay saved. Don't get tangled up in living for the flesh.